Welcome back, folks. We are back today with our good buddy, Mac Co, to continue our discussion on the topic of game addiction, or if we're calling it what it really is, game compulsion. Last week, we addressed the hype surrounding game compulsion and talked about why we felt so many young children spent their days in front of a screen. Today, we'll be looking at the problem most often associated with game addiction, adolescents and adults who withdraw from real life in favor of a virtual world. I'm going to tell you right now, this episode's going to be a bit unusual. We've been trying to figure out how to handle it for weeks. James has written and rewritten the script probably a dozen times. I think I've seen maybe 15 different intro paragraphs and 18 different closing statements for this episode since we started. I understand there's also a badly singed book of notes sitting in his apartment somewhere. Every time he's written it, it's just never come out right. But I think we have it figured out now. You see, that whole time we were trying to maintain objectivity on the issue and cover the topic in our usual academic, clinical way. But we've come to realize that may not be the best way to go this time. For James in particular, this topic is a little too close to home, and we decided it's better to just be honest, biases and all. So we're going to do something <laughs> very different today. Because this topic has much more personal significance for James, I think it's better if he'd be the one to talk about it. So, uh, yeah. Take it away, man. Hey, everyone. Dan's probably already told you this, but this has probably been the hardest episode for me to write, and I, I couldn't do it. Um, so this is what I got. It's my experience. My experience with game compulsion and where I'm at now. I had this revelation today um, because today I talked to the first girl I ever loved. Uh, she'd come back after a decade. Last time I saw her, we were teenagers. Uh, now she's a doctor. I Lots of good memories. I remember kissing her on the hood of my RX-7 before fleeing the city myself for, uh, for eight years. But here we were reminiscing over coffee about the past that seemed a beautiful lifetime away. Um, and we were adults. I watched her laugh with an ease she had never had when we were young. She'd grown and I'd grown and uh, in that moment I realized how much better life had become. How far from the awkward child I had been when she first knew me that I'd come. I realized so clearly how much better life gets when you don't turn away from it, which is something that I once did. Um, when people talk about game addiction, they always ask why games are addictive, uh, rather than what void do they fill. And right there is where the conversation goes wrong. When you routinely choose games over things you know to be important, or you cease participating in areas of life that you used to find important to play games. Uh, you suffer from game addiction or game compulsion. Uh, I tread that road. My closest friend sprinted down it. Um, but nobody heads that way because their life is perfect. No one picks up a game and becomes an addict. Um, when you... Uh, and well, I guess that's the heart of the issue. Games aren't addictive. But they offer something that is. They offer us uh, validation. Often people talk about game addicts as lazy or indolent or incapable or stupid, but nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, rather, everyone I've ever run into who has had to wrestle with this particular demon at some point in their life was a child full of promise. And therein sort of lies the trap. I watch smart, capable people submerge their lives behind the safe unreality of games when the real world uh, tells them that all the things they consider good about themselves aren't worthwhile. When with all their intellect, their ability to reason, their willingness to doggedly produce sue a goal, they still get dumped or lose their job or get served notice for divorce. At that point, they turn to games because Games agree with them that those traits are important, that uh, they reward them. Games reward people for exactly those skills. And unfortunately here, at least in the U.S., high school and college is a time where the world shows us just how little it can care about some of those things that we're most proud of, some of the things that we find best about ourselves. Um, for me, it was high school. I had a lot of things going for me at the time. Um, I found my little misfit tribe in the theater group. 
later I, I had my guitar. Lots of things outside of games I could reinforce my sense of self. Yet I still walk that road. It started with um, started with Ultima Online. I remember the first time I ever taped down keys to make my character run into a wall and play an instrument uh, to gain skill while I slept. I felt mm, clever. I went out into the world of Britannia and it was more exciting than my world. I let me tinker, let me explore. Excited my curiosity in a way that my classroom work just never did. Um, I had played MUDs on my dial-up, so this seemed no different, uh, but it was the first time I routinely lost sleep for a game. It was the first time I found my days possessed by thoughts of an electronic world. During classes I imagined new character builds. When I should have been doing homework, I would daydream about that night's run. I told myself it didn't matter. My grade slipped, but I was still passing everything by a wide margin. I still saw friends. I considered it just uh, good fun. Um, next, it was StarCraft. Uh, I, I found this tiny room um, with a computer with internet access uh, at my school. It had unrestricted install privileges. Um, and uh, I started spending most of my lunches there, even though uh, it was funny because it was the room that the central heat distribution pipes ran through. And so it, it had to have been at least 100 degrees in that room most days. Um, but I played through without thinking of the heat or the food I should have been eating, what I might be missing out on. Um, but in the end, it was EverQuest. Uh, I was an EverQuest junkie. That's my confession. My my closest friend skipped school to pick us up two copies on a la on launch day. Um, he was a year older than me. We had met through theater and bonded over games. Uh, he was right there with me over the wire when he hunting Ettons in Britannia at 3 a.m. Um, he was on the LAN when we'd do Battle.net 2v2s. Uh, there was this period for six months where we didn't speak after he'd stolen this girl I had a terrible crush on. Um, but I had been too shy at the time to ask out. He never figured it out though. Uh, that should have been my warning sign. He was so focused on games that he never put together why I was hurt. But in the end, we bonded again over games. All was forgiven. After all, who else would get my inside jokes, mostly jokes about games. Um, for the next few months, uh, we were fiends and pushers. I remember that on the few occasions where we, uh, one of the few occasions where we actually left the house voluntarily um, was if, you, if you're familiar with Seattle, we drive up to Aurora to get a cheap PC for another very dear friend of mine who was an ardent Mac user. He had a Mac sticker on his car, um, but this was his first PC. Uh, no argument could ever convince him to purchase one, but after we started telling him day after day about the wonders of EverQuest, uh, EverQuest eventually won out. Um, after that, uh, my grades really started to crash. I, I quit the play I was in, um, actually angry that I had gotten a large role because all I could think about was how it would cut into my grinding. Um, I was pretty much living off Hot Pockets and Bugles. Uh, I would strategize about how to steal hours of sleep during classes, classes that I knew I could get through without looking at the text. Um, then it sort of hit its nadir. I, uh, I was put on active word on probation, um, but I didn't care. The first thing I did was go play EverQuest to try and forget about it. Um, I actually remember that night uh, we were we were waiting for one of our friends to come from a distant zone, um, and he got on the boat uh, to come to our zone, and he never arrived. He just kept zoning back and forth. Every time we did the slash who, we'd we'd see him in one of these boat zones um, because uh, he'd he'd fallen asleep on the boat. We just kept laughing and laughing. We thought it was ridiculous. Um, we we didn't even realize how absurd it was that we couldn't even stay awake playing our own game anymore. That's how sort of strung out we were. Um, but luckily things sort of changed for me at that point. Um, 
there was a night where we were all supposed to go out to a movie, but me being too much of a fuck up at that point, I, uh, I missed it, um, perhaps unconsciously, perhaps intentionally, uh, I, I missed the film. Um, because I didn't, I, I guess I didn't even want to see our friends. Um, and for some reason it just happened that the, the shyest, quietest girl in our group of friends couldn't make it either. And to this day, I don't know why I did something so uncharacteristic for me at the time. But I called her up and asked her if she wanted to go to a later show. By the end of the night, she, she was in my arms. Um, and after that, things picked up for a bit. Uh, she was in charge of lighting at the school play. She got me to sign back up for the play as a stagehand. Um, we talked about colleges and she showed me all the pamphlets she'd gotten. Um, they sent her a lot. She got a perfect score on the SATs. Um, and I started getting out more uh, and uh, sort of, I mean, she opened up and became more social too. It was good. Um, I cut down my hours and my friends zoomed ahead of me as we needed, I think, 30, maybe 35 on EverQuest. Um, then one day they all showed up at my door, my friends, my companions of my long quest-filled hours. Uh, the first thing they said to me was, the expansion packs out. Uh, they came in and we started talking about it and we were going to re-roll and start new characters with a new race. They needed someone to be their healer. Uh, we talked about the new zones for hours, uh, how they were so much faster XP, um, how we started plotting about how we could improve faction um, uh, to make it to back to the old continent without being kill on sight, if any of you guys, if you guys remember Kunark. Um, and uh, by the end of the evening, they told me they had got an extra copy shipped out for me. And I called the girl I loved and told her I, I just I needed a weekend with the guys. Um, well, while I'd been gone, they'd <laughs> they'd actually learnt Linux and built a machine and got it set up for a show EQ. Uh, the program, this program that reads packets uh, being sent from the server so they could get all sorts of data like a usable map and monster spawn information, all this stuff. Um, it was a new experience. We, we were so much faster and better at everything. The new race was powerful. We started blazing through levels. And soon I was there again pretty much every night. Um, the same pattern emerged. I kind of let my real life fall apart. I'm not, I'm not ashamed of many things in my life. But I am ashamed of how I acted then. Um, I let a lot of people I cared about down. I missed a lot of important moments. One day, my best friend's girlfriend came to me in the hall and dragged me aside. She told me that the night before, she had been begging for him to come to bed and Instead, he sat there looking at pictures of the new zones. Um, by the time she was done crying against my chest and telling me how humiliating it was to not be able to compete with a video game, um, how she hated these things and the way she felt, uh, I, I mean, I went, I went to comfort her because, I mean, the funny thing is, this is. This is the girl that I would have killed for. This is the girl who, uh, previously, before, before meeting the one I did, um, she was the one who I stopped talking to my closest friend for six months over. And yet, as soon as she was done crying on my shoulder, uh, I told her I'd talk to him, but I went back and told him exactly what she said, and then I helped plot with him how he could smooth things over uh, while losing as little time at EQ as possible. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I said it, but there, there are a few memories I'm ashamed of. I've 
always try to live my life by a pretty simple set of beliefs. Do as little harm as possible, do what good you can, and uh, in fairness, let nobody call you a hypocrite. Um, and that's pretty much it. But every time I think about that conversation, I just get this knot in my gut. Um, and you know who you are, but I know you're not watching this. But for what it's worth, I'm still sorry. I'm sorry till today. Um, the experience though shook me, even then. I tried to tell the girl I loved about how I was struggling with this game, but instead I was rambling. I ended up telling her more about the game and how hard it was to pull away. And uh, even though I knew, I wanted to express to her that I, I knew I'd be happier spending more time with him. Um, and while I was rambling, while I was, ended up pretty much just telling her about EverQuest. Uh, I was telling her something about the City of Mist when she stopped me and said, uh, James, I think I might be pregnant. Um, this, I, I mean, this was it. I, I shook. This was the great dam of reality crashing down and the floods were rolled in. I held her, I told her how much I loved her, how I'd do anything for her. I told her I'd get rid of all my stupid games that night. I felt so wretched and pathetic and miserable. She had been acting odd for the last week. I didn't pick up on it because I was so wrapped up in my fantasy world. But it became clear the moment she spoke. Uh, it became clear how much I'd missed. How much uh, of the empathy that my teachers and directors used to laud me for had been cut off by this filter of another existence. I begged her to forgive me. I promised to be more than I was. Luckily it turned out she wasn't pregnant, but the experience got me to put away EQ and limit myself to console games when I had time to play. I didn't go back to my friend's basement. They got angry at me for abandoning them. They felt betrayed that their healer had left when they were just going to start doing City of Mist. But I found that life will always welcome you back. This is the important thing. I, uh, I pulled up my grades, I rejoined the theater group, I picked up a guitar. Uh, over the summer I crammed hard for the SATs. I, uh, as fall rolled around, I spent my EverQuest hours writing and rewriting my entrance essays. Uh, I thought of getting into college as an EQ quest. Um, all the skills I had thrown at the game, uh, I found that life rewards you for using them. Um, you have to apply them to the right things and apply them as tenaciously as you did when playing. But still, life welcomes you back. Um, I won't ever say that everything was easy or it was perfect. I won't say that I, I've won every battle with this that I fought. But I did end up going to the college of my dreams. I've gotten to play music in almost every state. I ended up working on the games I love. Um, today, the man who designed the core systems for EverQuest is a close friend. Um, the buddy of mine who we got a PC for, who we rode out to Aurora, works at PopCap, four blocks from where I live. Um, Richard Garriott actually even wrote a chapter for a book I did on invented languages. Uh, heck, I, I've actually even gotten to see almost every civ wonder that's still standing. Um, life is pretty good. Um, because most importantly, uh, I'm surrounded by people who... I love and will join me in all the crazy endeavors I do. I still treat each moment like I did when playing at request. Uh, challenges to be conquered through rigor and thought and application. I still pick a desired goal for a lark and try and figure out how to end up there. Whether it's being an independent designer or getting to talk about games every day of the week with awesome people. Uh, I still grind life with the work ethic that the game taught me. Um, but for all its lessons, um, I paid too high a price for them, and my friend never learned them. Uh, in the end, he dropped out of college before a year was up. He couldn't hold a steady job, and he n never moved out of his parents' basement. Um, the last time I heard of him uh, was a few years back. My buddy at PopCap tried to get him a tester position there, and he lasted for a few weeks. Um, he sort of made games addiction, games compulsion, a self-fulfilling self prophecy. He uh, 
life didn't live up to his expectations, so he turned from it towards games. But when life offered him opportunities, at the first sign of challenge, he'd run back to hiding behind games because he was afraid that life would reject him again. But really, life always welcomes you back. You just can't run too soon. I know dozens of people who have struggled with games addiction, and every one of them uh, who took that terrifying first step of walking boldly back into the real world, despite all the prospects of rejection and failure, were met with open arms. Once you're past high school, maybe past college, you'll find that life embraces the gamer mindset that if you use all those things that games taught you uh, and you fight for it, the real world has wonders that you could never find in a game. So if I just, I know this is going to run really long, but a few more quick things. Um, first, if you do, uh, if you feel like you do suffer from game promotion, don't think of the years that you spent playing games as wasted years. Don't ever think of yourself as impossibly behind. It's not true. There are always options. Th thinking this way just serves as an excuse to continue avoiding the real life for games. Um, but you don't have to. Life will welcome you back. Second, junkies push, push junk. If one of your friends is trying to ramp down on their gaming or break free of something they consider destructive, don't lure them back in. Uh, this has happened to me, I mean, and I've done it at times. It's bad news. Don't do it. Uh, I mean, everyone I know who's ever wrestled with this has a story similar to mine where uh, as soon as they first broke free of their gaming compulsion, uh, it was their friends who brought them back in. Um, and so, I mean, I guess just don't be that person. We're more than that. Uh, and lastly, just know you're not alone. I mean, if you suffer from game compulsion, this is something I didn't realize when I was much younger, but uh, not you're not alone, not online, and not in the real world. Uh, there are thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, who are facing the same struggles and who are battling the same demons that you are. There's The community is there to help you. Gamers show much love. Uh, I promise you that members of our disparate family will be willing to help you uh, figure out how to get your GED, enroll in community college, apply for a job. No shame. Um, in fact, if you have any questions along those lines, uh, feel free to use our Facebook page. It's not much, but it's a start. We're going to try and get uh, the forms ready on the extracurricular forms, and with any luck, they'll be up by the time this video shows, uh, as a place for everybody to get together and discuss these things and share their stories and uh, ask for help when they need it. So, um, I don't know. I'm sorry that I couldn't write the more clinical episode about games addiction, games compulsion, that I set out to write. But this is what I've got. This was me, plain truth. So I hope it can do somebody some good because, I don't know, if, if one person takes a step towards the life they want because of all the blood that went into this, it's a bargain. Um, and you know what? I still play games. I, you can say I have been. I do it for a living. I don't have time to play it them like I used to, but life's better for that. So good luck all of you, and I hope we can help.